100 years ago, over 1,200 African American men, locally and from around the nation, arrived at Fort Des Moines, Iowa, determined to break racial barriers in a segregated U.S. Army. They were the very first class of black officer candidates in America's military, a major chapter in Iowa's history, America's history, and the rich history of our armed forces. African Americans served in every war prior to World War I. They officially became part of the Army during the Civil War in 1862. All black segregated units later fought against Native Americans, who still respectfully nicknamed them Buffalo Soldiers. The military, however, like American society as a whole, offered limited opportunities for the black recruits who fought to protect the very society that denied them. They would change all that. In the fall of 1917, 639 of these men became lieutenants and captains. They fought in the Great War, World War I, and returned home to fight for their civil rights. This is their story. When World War I began in Europe in 1914, many Americans pushed for a military preparedness program in case the U.S. joined in. The Army organized and held officers' training classes, but only for whites. In April 1917, America entered what was called the Great War, now commonly known as World War I. Even though African Americans entered the draft, American military planners and leaders and American society as a whole believed that blacks lacked the character, intelligence, and bravery to become officers. The U.S. Army eventually, but reluctantly, allowed for two all-black combat divisions to be led by white officers. Leaders in the newly formed NAACP pushed the Army to allow for the training of black officers. Heading this effort was Chairman Joel Spingarn, who had finished a white officer's training camp, and Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, one of America's most influential black leaders, an advocate for integration, and editor of the NAACP's monthly magazine, The Crisis. Few in the Army supported the idea, but one advocate was General Leonard Wood, Another was Secretary of War Newton Baker, a member of the Chicago chapter of the NAACP. Du Bois supported segregated black officers camp over no camp at all because he wanted black officers commanding black troops. He wrote, if this is our country, then this is our war. Black male college students and graduates organized a central committee composed primarily of fraternity men at Howard and Harvard universities they visited their representatives and senators on Capitol Hill, which resulted in Secretary Baker's announcement of the camp's formation at Fort Des Moines in May 1917. The Army organized its first class for black officer candidates in June 1917. Their role was to serve in the all-black combat divisions, commanding field troops, but serving under the white division leaders. Iowa's Governor William Harding expressed enthusiasm for the establishment of the camp in Iowa. He said when a race can come out of slavery and in so short a time be recognized as they have been in the establishment of this officer's training camp, it is a tribute to the race as well as to the great principles of representative government. Fort Des Moines offered ample space to hold the camp. It had grown into an attractive facility by World War I, but by then the facility stood practically empty because most of the troops stationed here had been dispatched to the Mexican border, chasing the elusive revolutionary, Pancho Villa. Iowa offered a suitable place to train black officer candidates because it was known to be more racially tolerant than many other states. Many hoped the highest ranking black officer in the army, Colonel Charles Young, would command the camp. Instead, this proven Spanish-American war combat veteran was unfairly forced into retirement for high blood pressure and Colonel Charles Ballou assumed command of the camp. A relatively sympathetic Ballou said to the candidates, your race will be on trial with you as its representatives. Ballou's trainers were white West Point graduates. The trainees day started with Reveille at 5.30. Similar to the white camps, 
Activities consisted of intensive marching and drilling, physical training, infantry ways and fighting skills, shooting, semaphore training and trench warfare tactics, lights out at 945. Unlike the other training camps, black candidates and later graduates were denied training in artillery, engineering and machine guns, which much aggrieved many candidates and damaged morale. Racial strife was minimal in Des Moines, yet to alleviate any potential racial tensions, Ballou organized the White Sparrow Patriotic Ceremony at Drake Stadium on July 22, 1917. The candidates paraded and sang spirituals to 10,000 onlookers who enjoyed the performance. Candidate James Morris of Des Moines said that after the ceremony, we were rarely hassled by whites at Fort Des Moines or out in the city. Finally, in October, 639 men graduated as captains and lieutenants. They were paid in gold coins, $75. At the same time, another historical first occurred at Fort Des Moines. To fill the medical needs of the two all-black combat divisions, the Army recruited and trained black doctors for the division's medical arm. Thus, the fort's medical camp began shortly after the officer camp began. Both groups trained concurrently and shared buildings and facilities at the fort. 104 physicians and 12 dentists graduated from the 10-week camp, and most worked with the 92nd Division. 89 of them served in France. They organized mobile medical hospitals, infirmaries, supervised medics, and oversaw ambulance services and took steps to maintain the general health of the troops. As the 92nd Division Buffalo Soldiers entered the thick of combat in the late summer of 1918, casualties mounted. Most of the Fort Des Moines graduates joined the 27,000-man 92nd Division, nicknamed the Buffaloes. Their motto, deeds, not words. Officers and soldiers were trained separately stateside under largely segregated conditions at different camps. Many whites feared being outranked by blacks and found the idea of saluting them repulsive. Most of the higher ranking white officers in the 92nd Division were Southerners, unsupportive of black officers, hardly a recipe for high morale. In France, they finally received weapons training, though not nearly as much as their white counterparts. The 92nd entered the trench lines in eastern France for patrolling and scouting duties until they were rushed to the Meuse-Argonne region, the site of America's huge offensive at the final stages of the war. The 93rd Division, in which a few Fort Des Moines graduates served, had a markedly different experience. They were among the first American troops to arrive in France. They fought with the French army, and many wore French helmets and used French arms. The most decorated black unit of the war was the 369th Regiment, the so-called Harlem Hellfighters, a New York National Guard unit, part of the 93rd Division. From this hard-fighting, highly decorated unit, its regimental band led by James Reese Europe, introduced Europeans to a new musical art form, jazz. A few Fort Des Moines graduates served in all black units that became known as services of supply. One historian called them laborers in uniform, or the military equivalent of chain gangs. Performing such tasks as building roads and latrines, digging ditches, disposing garbage, and caring for animals. They received very little training, comparatively low pay, and horrid treatment. The worst job was graves registration finding, recording, and reburying the dead. This grim but important work took care of thousands of those killed in action. About one-third of all labor troops were blacks, a total of about 160,000. Black soldiers were banned from the Grand Victory Parade in Paris on Bastille Day 1919 but their service in France instilled pride and hope for a more equal world with a determination to make it happen. Who were some of these men? Iowa contributed 16 officer candidates, nine graduated, 
Charles P. Howard Sr. and James B. Morris Sr. both served in France and returned to Des Moines to live after the war. Howard, a Drake Law School graduate, practiced law in Des Moines, as did Morris. Howard was a locally prominent civil rights activist. In addition to his legal practice, Morris, who earned his law degree from Howard University, edited the black newspaper The Iowa Bystander and fought for racial equality in Iowa. These men, along with candidate S. Joe Brown, founded the National Bar Association in 1925. As members of the Iowa Negro Bar Association, these lawyers formed the first of its kind national organization in reaction to discrimination in the nation's legal community. Another well-known Iowan, James Jimmy Mitchell, moved to Des Moines after the war. He opened a community pharmacy in the Center Street neighborhood. He also operated a popular nightclub on Center Street. Black candidates from all over the country came to Fort Des Moines. This native Mississippian always called himself Lieutenant Lee because he served heroically as a Buffalo soldier in France. After the war, he settled in Memphis, Tennessee and became a successful policeman, businessman, author, and political activist. He is an iconic figure in Memphis history. Cameron left a teaching job in Nashville at age 45 to join the black officer's camp. While on scout patrol in France during the Argonne Offensive, this Buffalo soldier was killed in action. His hometown has honored his service by naming a school and an American Legion post in his honor. This star athlete from South Dakota became a coach and teacher at Tuskegee University in Alabama until the Great War interrupted his career. After training at Fort Des Moines, he fought in France with the 92nd Division in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. After the war, he returned to Tuskegee and became a legendary coach in football and track and field, leading the country's first black female Olympic gold medalist, Alice Coachman. Dr. Lewis Wright graduated from the medical officer's training camp and fell victim to a phosgene gas shell while attending to patients in a French field hospital. After his recovery, Wright made numerous contributions to the field of medicine and became known as Mr. Harlem Hospital. He was one of the longest serving directors of the NAACP from the 1930s through the 1950s. Louisiana born and Harvard educated Warmoth T. Gibbs fought in France with the 92nd Division. After the war, his distinguished education career included his leadership at the University of North Carolina A&T in Greensboro in 1960, where four of his students initiated the now legendary segregation protest and sit-ins against Woolworths. Instead of discouraging the sit-ins at the urging of white city leaders, Gibbs responded, we teach our students how to think, not what to think. This event was an important spark in the civil rights movement. Charles Hamilton Houston became one of the great pioneer civil rights litigators following his military service. He was commissioned at Fort Des Moines and fought in France. After suffering innumerable humiliations, he became a lawyer and fought for his race. He wrote, I made up my mind that if I got through this war, I would study law and use my time fighting for men who could not strike back. He mentored America's first African-American Supreme Court Justice, Thurgood Marshall. Houston earned the title, The Man Who Killed Jim Crow. Many other officers enjoyed successful careers in a number of fields. They were emboldened by their Army experience at Fort Des Moines. In 1948, 31 years after that class graduated, President Harry Truman officially ended segregation in the armed forces. One historian has characterized the World War I experience that started at Fort Des Moines as a turning point, a bloody catharsis at home in which African Americans gained a new generation of leadership prepared to confront racial discrimination. They also understood their roles as heroes to the black community and as protest leaders against white supremacists. 
This group of men were among those who laid the groundwork in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Thus, in the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, we return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. Oh, 